Hey everyone, so welcome back to the Summer Pi series and in this video we'll finally start to get into the data, where to get it, what is it, how to use it. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So I'm going to open this web browser and what you're going to want to do is go to a website called Kaggle.com. And this is basically a data science hub. And while it's most known for its interesting competitions, it's really just a great place to learn overall about data science and the different problems going on in there. Uh, they have a lot of data sets, they have a lot of problems uh, that you can play with, and it's really a great forum uh, where the community is super helpful and interactive. A lot of the code is shared, so you get to see what good data scientists are doing to approach a lot of these problems. Uh, but anyways, what you're going to want to do is make an account and then log in. So I'll give you a second to do that. But once you're logged in, we'll go to the search bar and you'll want to search for plastic with double C's. Just click on any of them. And then at the very top over here, we're going to see plastic astronomical classification. So click on that and it'll bring us to the main uh, competition page. But before we do anything, if you want to get the data, make sure you go to rules and you accept the rules for this competition. It's not going on anymore, but you still have to do it if you want to download the data. So make sure you accept these uh, rules. Then we'll go to overview real quickly. And basically this is where they talk about the project or the competition, what they're trying to do, what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, so we have the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope and it's really going to revolutionize the field. We're going to be able to classify a lot of objects automatically. Um, so that's going to be incredible. But yeah, so if you want, read the overview, but we're really interested in the data. As you could see, they have a list of descriptions for what the variables are. But before we get into that, uh, feel free to download the data which is right here, data sources. And when you hover over a data set, a download button will appear on the side. And we're really just interested in training set and training set metadata. These are the only data samples that have targets or classes with them. And that's what we need to train a neural network model. Um, so we don't, we don't really care about these other data sets right now because we can't use them to train. They're really just for us to run our model and submit. Um, but yeah, get training set and training set metadata. Okay, so once that's downloaded, let's get into the data and what everything is. So there's a list of descriptions here. I'll go over some of them, but not all of them. <laughs> so we have right ascension, declination, galactic longitude, and galactic latitude. These are basically just coordinates for the object. Um, right ascension and declination, I believe that's with respect to their location in the sky from Earth. Um, and then galactic longitude and galactic latitude is their position with respect to the, to the galaxy, basically. Then we have whole scale spec Z and whole scale photo Z. And Z is really just a variable for redshift. And there's two ways to measure it. We have spectroscopic and photometric. And spectroscopic is actually a more accurate measure of the redshift. So I think when we start working with the data, we actually can ignore photo Z. Hey everyone, before we continue, I forgot to talk about what redshift is. Redshift is commonly compared to Doppler shift. So if you think of a siren of a fire truck moving towards you or away from you, you could tell that there's a difference in sound. This is a property of waves, and we know that light behaves as a wave as well. So when a galaxy is moving away from us, its light becomes redshifted, its wavelength becomes longer. Most galaxies as seen from Earth are actually redshifted because of universe expansion. As the universe expands, galaxies are moving further away from us. One of the strangest things that astronomers found is that the universe expansion is accelerating. This means that objects that are further away are moving away faster, and we could use this observation to measure distance to different objects. We also have Hoskal Photo Z error, and 
Although we might not use Photo Z, I just want to talk about the importance of error when working with machine learning. So we also have flux error here. And error is very important in physics, not just to define the statistical significance of your work and not just to define the constraints of what you found, but also the value of the error could tell a lot about what the object could be. Based on our current technologies and theories, we could only measure things to a certain limit and that error helps define what that limit is and it could help tell us what we're measuring. So that could be a very important variable to identifying what an object could be. And we have MWEBV, which is basically just the extinction of light. So if you think about it, if there's an object where their light is coming towards Earth, it's not going to have a perfect path on the way to us. It might bump into some galactic dust or some other objects throughout the galaxy or throughout the universe. There's actually a lot of light that doesn't reach Earth. And we have to account for that. And that's what this property handles. Of course, we have the target. We need to know what the object is in order to train and learn. So that's all the variables in the metadata set. And now we're going to get into the data in the training set.csv. Basically, we have MJD, which stands for modified Julian date. And this is just a convenient unit of time that astronomers use because we deal with systems that live over very long time scales. And it's just more convenient because then you don't have to deal with leap years or how many days are in a certain month. Yeah, you could avoid all of that. Next, we have passband. We've talked about this before, the LSST has six different passbands so that it could focus in on different wavelengths of light. And then we also have flux, which is basically the brightness of the object and how much light it emits. And if you combine this with a unit of time, such as MJD or modified Julian date, then we could create light curves, which measures how the amount of light changes over time. And this is a really important variable because it tells us a lot about what the object could be. If we see a huge spike that decreases gradually right after, then it could be a supernova. But if there's a periodic change in light, then it could be a binary system or a variable star. So flux and light curves are very useful information in classifying objects and we'll be looking to use this as much as we can. And then we have flux error, and again, error could be a very important variable for determining what an object could be. So that was most of the variables, at least the ones I wanted to talk about. So now let's get into the caveats. So of course, experiments don't always go as perfectly as we'd like it to. They probably never go as perfectly as we'd like it to. So there are some things that we have to take into account before we start messing with the data, one of which are data gaps and it says here different passbands are taken at different times sometimes many days apart and why does this matter well for one thing if an event's not periodic you might record something that's in one passband but not in the other and it's because it's recorded at a different time you might have missed a certain event so the data that's collected at these different times might not match up and it could mess with the way your model runs another caveat is the galactic versus extragalactic. And this is a small one because I think it depends on what model you're using for whether or not it becomes a serious issue. Uh, but basically, if you think about certain events that are exclusively outside of our galaxy, like active galactic nuclei, then you want to make sure that your model is able to predict that it's extragalactic. Um, but other systems, we might only be interested within our galaxy because trying to detect them outside of our galaxy could be very difficult. So finding exoplanets might be really difficult if trying to find them in other galaxies. And then also finding red dwarfs. These are things that are just very difficult to detect just because of the size of a planet is super small and the brightness of a red dwarf could be low and it's very small as well. And then we have negative flux. And this might just be a small caveat that we won't need to worry about too much. Basically, astronomers calibrate their telescope with a reference image. And that could lead to other images detecting like a negative flux just because 
the brightness from that image is lower than the reference one but basically you could treat the negative flux as zero the reason it's a caveat is because it's kind of weird to think of oh what does it mean to have a negative flux like how do you how do you emit a negative amount of light so just in case that was a concern they wanted to address that but yeah, that's basically the data. We have it now. We're ready to work with it. We've gone over some of the variables. We know that light curve data is something that we're really interested in. It's gonna help us identify a lot of objects. And with that, I hope you enjoyed this video. In the next one, we'll start to use Python and start to process all this data. So I hope to see you there. Bye.